VXLAN and VPC are two of my favourite technologies. When we combine them, we get the advantages of the fabric, as well as the host level redundancy. But when we mix the two, some of the rules change, so you've got to really understand what's going on. If you don't, you could end up black holing traffic, which is exactly what happened to me just a few weeks ago. I'm going to show you how we can add VPC to VXLAN, and how we can avoid black holing traffic. Let's take a brief moment to review what VPC and VXLAN do separately before we look at how they work together. VPC is a type of multi-chassis ether channel, which is found only on Nexus switches. This is a layer 2 technology that allows us to connect a device to two switches at once, without creating loops and without needing to block certain links. From the point of view of the connected device, it is attached to a single switch using an ether channel or a lag. This is made possible due to a connection between the two parent switches called the peer link. Traffic may pass over the peer link when needed, but generally the switch that receives the traffic also forwards the traffic. If this sounds a bit confusing, I'd recommend reading up on how ether channels and lags work. And that's basically what VPC is. It's an ether channel that uses two parent switches instead of one. The important takeaway here is that the peer link is critical as it's the glue that joins the parent switches together. Sometimes we may have devices connected to a single switch only. These switch ports are called orphan ports. If you'd like to dig deeper into VPC before continuing, I have a three part series which should help you out. Now over to VXLAN. We're familiar with using VLANs and we know that we need to be careful when stretching them across too many devices. This is one of the things that VXLAN helps us with. VXLAN uses an overlay and an underlay. The overlay is our layer 2 network. The underlay is a layer 3 routed network. The switches on the edge of the topology each have a virtual interface called a VTEP. When our layer 2 frames arrive at the switch, the VTEP encapsulates the traffic into an IP packet and forwards it across the underlay network. The remote VTEP decapsulates the packet into the original frame for delivery to the destination device. This encapsulation process makes VXLAN a form of tunneling. The devices in the layer 2 network, that's the overlay, don't even know that there is an underlay here. When we're talking about the underlay, the best practice is to arrange the devices in a spine leaf topology. Now this is not a requirement. We can use other topologies and VXLAN will still work. But the spine leaf topology is very scalable and it is deterministic. It uses a layer of spine switches and a layer of leaf switches. All of these devices need to be layer 3 capable. The leaves are where the devices are connected. Leaf switches are also where VTEPs live. The spines are used to forward traffic. Each leaf connects directly to every spine using a routed link. The entire fabric runs an IGP in the underlay. This makes it dynamically handle link failures and reroutes around them. A topology like this means that every VTEP is exactly two hops away from every other VTEP. That's what makes this design deterministic. If you need to refresh further, I have a six part VXLAN series that will bring you up to speed. When we add VPC to a VXLAN topology, we break the true spine leaf arrangement. Under normal conditions, leaf switches do not connect to each other. However, the peer link is critical. We need to have one, so we have to add it between the Nexus pairs. Keep in mind that this is a layer 2 link, not a layer 3 link like the connections to the spine layer. For the most part, VPC is still configured as normal. We definitely need to use the peer gateway command though, so keep that in mind. You should already be aware that we use loopback interfaces with VXLAN. It's used by the VTEP or NVE interface. But VPC changes the loopback too. We need to add a secondary IP. Now here's the odd bit. The secondary IP has to be the same on both switches. 
This is because the VPC pair needs to look like a single switch to the rest of the network. So, for a lot of show commands, that secondary IP is the one that you'll see. The primary IP is used by layer 3 protocols, so it still needs to be unique on both switches. You'll remember that BUM traffic, or broadcast, unknown unicast, and multicast traffic requires special consideration on VXLAN. This traffic is replicated across the peer link using VLAN 4041, which is a special purpose VLAN. Notice that the peer link is used for this traffic. Previously, in a non-VPC environment, it would have been sent through the uplinks to the spines. This is another way we change the default behavior of VXLAN when we add VPC. Now, the peer link, it's special. If the peer link fails, VPC goes through some special error handling procedures to prevent split brain. This includes disabling VPC ports on the secondary switch. And now that we've added VXLAN to the picture, it has one more task to perform. Remember the loopback interface with the secondary IP? If the peer link goes down, this interface will be shut down on the secondary switch. This is something that we need to keep in mind when we design our solution. I'll explain some more best practices around this very soon. But before that, I want to remind you to keep your VPC configuration the same on both VPC switches. This includes all configuration that joins VPC and VXLAN together. If you suspect you have a problem around this, use these commands here to get some detail from the switches. There are a few best practices which you should be aware of before we continue. Firstly, we should always use different loopback interfaces for BGP peering and for the NVE interface. Remember how I said that a peer link failure could cause the VPC secondary switch to shut down its loopback? If you're using the same loopback for IBGP peering, you'll now find yourself in trouble. If there's a failure, we need to think about how to improve recovery. We should use the delay restore interface VLAN command. This tells a switch that's recovering to wait a while before participating in VPC, which gives the pair some time to converge. Cisco's recommendation is a delay of 45 seconds in an environment that has 1000 VNIs and 1000 SVIs. Also to help improve convergence times, you should enable peer switch. You should use ARP sync if you're using IPv4, and neighbor discovery sync if you're using IPv6. Even in a VXLAN and VPC environment, you should still have spanning tree enabled. The hello timers should be changed to a four second interval. This prevents spanning tree sending unnecessary topology change notifications if there is a VPC role change. And that's enough of the best practices for now. We're now gonna look at a concept called the backup routing SVI. If you don't do this right, you might find yourself in a world of pain. I'm speaking from experience here. I spent a week and a half trying to figure out why VXLAN wasn't working right, and it was all down to this. First, we'll look at what can go wrong, and then I'll show you how to prevent it. Imagine that one of our switches loses its uplink to the VXLAN fabric. The peer link is still up though, so VPC itself is working. Traffic arrives on this switch and it is encapsulated, but it can't be forwarded out as the uplinks are down. The switch doesn't have any layer three links anymore, so the traffic is dropped. To solve this, we create a new VLAN, which we allow on the peer link and only on the peer link. You shouldn't be using this VLAN anywhere else. We create SVIs on each peer with IP addresses in the global routing table. These are then advertised into our IGP. We should also configure PIM. During a Cisco Live session I attended in 2018, the speaker said that we need PIM even if we're using ingress replication. However, I was reading an article on Cisco's website that suggested that we don't need it. So I tested ingress replication without adding PIM and it worked just fine for me. You may want to do your own research before committing to that in production though, I'll leave that up to you. Now that we've done this, there is an alternate layer three path through to the VXLAN fabric. So VXLAN will work again. Now there is a caveat that we need to be aware of. 
Some models like the 93180YC switches use a particular ASIC that requires an additional command, and that is the infra VLANs command. This tells the switch that this VLAN is necessary for VXLAN to run, but is not part of VXLAN itself. That is, it doesn't have a VNI mapped to it. Now I did notice, that, and, and this may depend on the switch version you're running, that the CLI tells you it needs a reboot when this command is configured. However, in practice, I found this is not accurate, and it started working for me straight away. No reboot required. Most of the time, the backup routing SVI won't really do much. But if there is a fault, which I did experience myself in production, this can really save you. Now that you understand the special details of combining these two technologies, you should be good to go ahead and give it a try. I still do suggest practicing it in a lab before you throw it into production. If this has been helpful, please like the video and subscribe as it helps YouTube to suggest it to other viewers. And let me know what you thought of this video in the comments below.